Okay, so um, I am going to get started and we'll let people trickle in as the time proceeds. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Solutions That Scale seminar this month. My name is James Bullock and I'm the Dean of the School of Physical Sciences. And today we have with us Professor Jack Brower, who's a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at UCI. Professor Brower is an expert in energy system dynamics, including renewable and zero emissions energy conversion and systems such as fuel cells, electrolyzers, and batteries. He's also interested in hydrogen production and hydrogen storage and conversion systems. Jack is the director of UCI's Advanced Power and Energy Program, which studies the development and deployment of efficient, environmentally sensitive, sustainable power generation and energy conversion worldwide. He's also the director of the National Fuel Cell Research Center here at UCI. Professor Brower obtained his MS and BS degrees right here at UCI, both in mechanical engineering and his PhD in mechanical engineering at MIT. I think he joined UCI um, in 1997, and we are lucky to have him as part of the Solutions at Scale initiative and doing his great work here on campus. Today, he's going to tell us about 100% renewable and zero emissions energy with hydrogen. Um, the plan is uh, Jack's going to give his talk, and then we're going to take have some time at the end of his talk, the last 15 minutes or so, to, to do questions and answers. Okay, Jack, go ahead. Thank you very much, James. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about 100% renewable and zero emissions energy with hydrogen. I'm also very pleased uh, to have been a founding participant and a member of the UCI Solutions That Scale initiative. This is a campus-wide initiative that is addressing global environmental problems and solutions to those uh, that are not always obvious or easy to implement. Um, the solutions are complex, multidimensional, and affect different stakeholders in different ways. And sometimes the stakeholders don't trust each other. So we're hoping to make a difference in this area to bridge among researchers, stakeholders, and decision makers, but also to develop globally actionable science together with trust. You can see um, some more about solutions that scale at this website. So I'm here today to talk about clean energy. And I wanted to start with the earth energy balance uh, from a basic first law of thermodynamics consideration. Because if we draw a control volume around the earth, um, the main interaction through the control volume comes from the sun. The sun has solar radiation that comes through this control volume into our earth. And some of it is reflected other, uh, is, other amounts of energy are re-radiated back out to space, okay, at a much different wavelength regime because of its lower temperature. And if you do a simple energy balance here, these are the things that cross the boundary of the control volume. Just the incoming solar radiation, reflected solar radiation, and Earth radiation back out to space. And this has led to the circumstance of primary energy on Earth that has produced fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are produced from dead plant and animal life, heat and pressure, and over millions to hundreds of millions of years, leading to fossil fuels that are available to us today. This is such a long time frame, however, that I'm putting a hash through this time here and, that, and having us consider other possible primary energy forms. Because biomass and biogas resources are naturally replenished, produced on Earth at a much shorter time frame. Actually, order of months to years, we get corn, trees, and grass. Hydropower is even more rapidly replenished naturally on Earth through evaporation of water, cloud formation, rain, and lakes that can gather hydropower. Wind power is even more uh, likely to be renewed fast on Earth, coming from the power of the sun, making temperature gradients that lead to pressure differences and wind. 
and the sun. Solar energy is instantly renewed the minute, uh, the instant that you use a unit of it up. We have another one coming at us, at least during the day. So the idea of energy sustainability has to consider the conversion of resources at the same rate at which they are naturally replenished on Earth. In other words, we can't use these biogas and biomass resources faster than the Earth is naturally making them for us. Similarly, with regard to fossil fuels, and it's pretty obvious that we have to move more and more towards all of these resources that are more quickly replenished on Earth. If we look at, for example, fossil fuels and their use in a time frame of human existence here, what you can see is that it's a delta function in the order of human history. It's quite obviously not a sustainable practice to use these as our main source of primary energy. It's obviously not sustainable. But I wanna point out in addition to the fact that it's a resource that we can't keep using this way, um, these resources also produce externalities. These fossil resources, while they have improved quality of life in many circumstances around the world, they are unfortunately also the most important cause of environmental and geopolitical problems. And I think one of the most important ones that we must always consider is criteria pollutant emissions. These are the emissions that lead to air quality problems even in the most sophisticated and restrictive environments in the world, like Los Angeles or Beijing, where serious health and air quality consequences result from the current way that we transform energy. These also are the most significant contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, and they have other consequences like resource recovery damage or resource depletion in certain regions that lead to geopolitical problems. And it's quite obvious that if we keep using the fossil, it's going to be gone. It's not going to be renewed naturally on Earth on the same time scale at which we are converting them. The good news is that solar and wind power and battery costs all have dramatically fallen in just the very recent past. And that's leading to a situation where these types of energy conversion from this naturally replenished quickly on earth resources like sun and wind power are becoming the cheapest forms of electricity and energy that we have in society. So this leads to very common and popular thinking amongst us humans on earth. <laughs> we think the main strategy is we're going to have 100% renewable primary energy input. Solar, wind, geothermal as examples of this. And you notice that that primary energy input is for power. That's what the sun and wind resources, geothermal resources are making. They're making electricity, power generation. As a result, you have to complement it with something like electrifying end uses. And this is actually very important. We should do more and more of the renewable power installing and electrification of end uses. And we should use batteries in all sorts of circumstances to handle the fact that these renewable resources are not necessarily available when the demand is required. And we can use these batteries also for end uses like cars. So this is the main strategy that we can envision. We can envision it because we live with it in our own neighborhoods we see solar panels, battery energy storage in the garage, and batteries in our cars. So some people say this is all we need. And as a matter of fact, we definitely don't want hydrogen because it's made from fossil fuels today. And we don't want hydrogen because making hydrogen from water and electricity is less efficient than charging a battery. 
and making electricity from hydrogen in a fuel cell is less efficient than a battery so that the round trip efficiency, electricity in to electricity out is lower than a battery. And that hydrogen is difficult to store and move around in society. So why should we invest in hydrogen? And some of the people that are promoting these arguments against hydrogen, I admire. And they're very influential. Their opinions matter. Interestingly, I agree with almost all of what is stated in this slide. It's just subtly untruthful. It doesn't tell the whole story for complete decarbonization, for completely zero emissions. If we want to get to completely zero emissions, we can't electrify all end uses. Some of them aren't amenable. We can use batteries to handle some of the intermittency on the grid and for some end uses, but not all. And the round trip efficiency of hydrogen energy storage is less than a battery, unless you wanna store energy for a long time. And hydrogen is difficult in, uh, to store and move around in society, but that is compared to fossil fuels, which we're not talking about here. If you compare hydrogen to batteries, it's easier to move around in society. So with these important caveats or additions, you have more of the complete picture that we need for achieving 100% renewable and zero emissions. So I will talk about now some reasons why hydrogen is important for our 100% renewable future. Shown here is a simulation of the state of California electric grid with only solar and wind power inputs in a wind dominant case. And here what we see is that every hour of the year, starting on January 1st and going all the way through to December 31st, the hour by hour availability of wind measured against the demand. And at some hours, you can see this red data appears, which indicates an hour of renewable energy deficit, meaning we have demand for electricity, but no wind or solar available. In the blue, these negative residual loads, these correspond to periods of time, time when the wind and solar power are available in excess of the demand for electricity. The good news is that if you integrate under the curve of all of these deficits and all of these surpluses, we have more energy available in the surpluses and we can store it and move it around to meet all of these deficits. So in other words, we can install enough wind and solar throughout the state of California and the dynamics are such that we can produce all of the energy needed for meeting all electricity demands with sun and wind power. We have enough land, we have enough resource. So all we need to do now is to move this around from hour to hour. And how do we do that today? We do it with pumped hydro. And you can see we have a very large pumped hydro system. If we turned all the pumps in these pumped hydro system on at once, we could absorb almost nine gigawatts of power. That's the height of this box. And we have pretty large lakes that are at, at higher elevation and lakes that are at lower elevation so that the total energy that we could deliver back to the system is indicated by the size of this box. You know, nine gigawatts for almost a whole month we could provide in our current pumped hydro system. But as you can see, that's not gonna be sufficient because it can't absorb all of this energy that's greater than nine gigawatts. And it's not enough energy to move all of this excess from this season to the other seasons. So some people think, let's use batteries for this. And I just wanna 
indicate that if we transformed all of the light and medium duty vehicles into Nissan LEAF vehicles, how big a resource that would be if we didn't use them for driving, but only used them as a grid resource for moving this renewable energy around. This is how big it would be. It would have quite a bit of power capabilities. You see how tall this is, but it's a very small amount of energy in comparison to the magnitude of energy we need to make this 100% renewable future possible. On the other hand, we could use existing natural gas storage facilities. And instead of storing natural gas, a fossil fuel, if we introduced hydrogen into those storage facilities, how large of a resource would it comprise? It would be this big. It would have nearly 50 gigawatts of equivalent electricity input. That is, we could use 50 gigawatts at any given hour through electrolyzers, okay, to produce hydrogen and inject it into the storage facilities. That's assuming we can inject hydrogen into those storage facilities at the same rate we're currently doing natural gas. Secondly, the storage of this renewable gas underground in existing facilities would have a massive amount of energy. You can see it's almost two months of storage at that um, demand level. You see that the gas system and current hydrogen storage facilities are the only ones that are of the appropriate magnitude to actually take the seasonal excess in the summer, for this case, and to move it to the fall and winter months. Batteries will not be big enough for this application. We did a similar computation for the entire world, um, trying to meet all of the total world energy demand with only solar and wind resources with various amounts of solar and wind in the various continents and looking at the dynamics. Um, hour by hour, how much sun and how much wind is available? How do we make that firm? It would take more than 19,900 terawatt hours of storage to make this possible. And again, I wanna see if it's possible to make this size of an energy storage system out of current lithium ion batteries. So to build one lithium ion battery at this scale would require 3,144 megatons of lithium and 25,800 megatons of cobalt. Lithium ion batteries are the very best batteries in the world. Um, and if you look at what's available worldwide in these two resources, we see that the world resources of lithium are only 53 megatons, orders of magnitude less than we need. Um, and world cobalt resources are only 25 megatons terrestrially, 120 if we want to mine the ocean floor. Again, here, what you see is that the very best batteries in the world cannot be made at this scale because we don't have sufficient resources. In addition, they come from primarily places that don't have good relationships with us, nor, nor good child labor laws or, <laughs> or other things. And so it would behoove us to not try to store this amount of energy using lithium ion batteries. There's not going to be enough lithium and cobalt in the world. We should rather use these very nice performing batteries where they make sense for things like our cell phones, for things like light duty vehicles. That's where we should use them. For this world energy demand, we need something else. And lithium ion batteries have a very nice and high round trip efficiency. As a matter of fact, we measure them in our laboratories and we get greater than 90% uh, round trip efficiency, electricity in to electricity out. But in utility applications, especially in those where st storage is required for a long duration, we see a much lower round trip efficiency. As a matter of fact, this is data from the California 
Public Utilities Commission, which is monitoring a whole bunch of these utility applications of lithium ion batteries. And what you can see is when the batteries are not used very often, that's the data here on the lower part of this capacity factor, we can have very low round trip efficiencies, even as low as 20%, okay? If the batteries have to store the energy for a long period of time. Self-discharge, which is unavoidable in lithium ion batteries and most other batteries, is, is the culprit. <laughs> That's what causes this low round trip efficiency when you store electricity in a battery for a long period of time. So for, again, long duration storage, batteries are not efficient enough because they suffer from self-discharge. And we've been studying hydrogen energy storage dynamics for a very long time. Um, this is an example of a study we did uh, using Texas wind, shown here for a week long period in the green line. Here, you can see the wind dynamics. Sometimes the wind's not blowing, sometimes it's blowing a lot, and it goes up and down during this week. And how can we match that to the demand of an adjacent city? And you can see here that demand is shown here in the magenta. And so whenever there was excess wind, we operated a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer to produce hydrogen from the wind power and water and stored it in an adjacent salt cavern. This is an underground storage facility that's widely available in Texas. Then when the wind was available in deficit, as you see from this short period of time, we would take the hydrogen out of the salt cavern through a proton exchange membrane fuel cell to make the electricity so that we can meet the demand of the city from 100% wind power plus hydrogen energy storage. And you can see here that the dynamics of our physical models enabled us to do this for this one week long period. And we looked at the pressure dynamics and temperature dynamics in the cavern. And you can see for again, this week long period, it stayed well within the maximum and minimum pressure limits. And interestingly, over the whole year, as shown in this right panel, you can see that excess wind power during the fall here and winter months and going into the spring is steadily leading to a buildup of hydrogen pressure in the salt cavern and giving most of that back to the city in the summer when demand was high. So you can see this one um, hydrogen storage system with fuel cells and electrolyzers is able to handle hourly weekly, daily, and even seasonal storage requirements for complementing wind to meet current demand. But what if we don't have a salt cavern? Well, I suggest that we have underground storage and transmission and distribution capabilities right here, right now that we should consider. And that is primarily comprised of our natural gas transmission, distribution, and storage system, depicted here for the Southern California Gas Service Territory. And you can see the major pipelines and the compression facilities, but also the major storage facilities that I previously analyzed in that first slide. Are these going to be big enough? In addition, can they engender the resilience and reliability that our zero emissions future needs. A recent study by the Gas Technology Institute indicates that these resources can deliver energy at greater than 99.39s thereafter percent availability, five nines of availability. That's, that's an important resource for delivering our renewable energy in the future. And then how big is it? If we just used the uh, SoCal gas service territory and we accounted for the round trip efficiency of going into hydrogen and back out, this would be, would be a 13 terawatt hour equivalent electricity storage device. 13 terawatt hours. This is equivalent to a $2.6 trillion battery 
at future DOE costs. Those numbers are so big, I was wondering if 5% hydrogen, just 5% hydrogen stored in the natural gas system might be also valuable. And it's 650 gigawatt hours if we just store 5% hydrogen, and that's worth $130 billion in future battery costs. Even these numbers are well above that which I have a good intuition for. So I wanna compare these to something maybe most of you would have better intuition. How about UC Irvine tuition and fees? We could pay for the entire population of Orange County, every man, woman, and child to go to four years of free school at UC Irvine if we just came up with 39, 39 billion. As a matter of fact, we could also look at all University of California schools and send every single student to four years of education. All UCs could be made free for only 4.7 billion. I, I, I present these numbers primarily, primarily to emphasize the point of how big a resource this is and how valuable it can be for introducing a storage function to our energy infrastructure. And not only the storage function, <laughs> but the transmission and distribution function as well. And we know that fuel cells connected to this system have proven resilience through all kinds of natural disasters, including the blackout in San Diego in 2011, winter storms and hurricanes, earthquakes, recent earthquakes, for example, in Ridgecrest, California, um, Manhattan blackouts, the gas system plus fuel cells have proven to be resilient under all of these circumstances. And I'm not the only one that's um, uh, uh, saying this or the only one that's analyzed this problem to realize how in influential and important hydrogen will be. I was very, I'm very fortunate to have worked with an outstanding group of scientists, engineers, and researchers from all around the world, led by my esteemed colleague, Steve Davis, to investigate a net zero emissions energy future. How can we really achieve completely zero emissions in all aspects of our economy? And what you can see here is that the answer is pretty complex. This diagram, from that science publication that resulted shows that we need sun and wind power in great amounts. We will likely need things like nuclear power and pumped hydro storage, but we also need to move other things around in society like hydrogen shown in the blue here, and maybe even hydrocarbons. And we need this hydrogen, especially for things like ammonia production aviation and long haul transit, cement and steel production, and these kinds of things. These are some things that are going to be very difficult to make zero emissions without something like hydrogen. As an example, we're going to need zero emissions fuels for any application that is difficult to make zero emissions without a light fuel. And shipping, buses, aviation, trains, and long haul trucks, anything that requires either rapid fueling, long range, or large payload. These kinds of features can be engendered by zero emissions hydrogen technology, but not necessarily by alternative battery electric zero emissions technology. There also are those industries, I referred to a couple of them earlier, that have requirements for high temperature heat, for a feedstock, or for a reducing gas. Hydrogen can do all of those things, and things like steel, cement, plastics, ammonia, computer chip manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, these kinds of things can be made zero emissions with renewable hydrogen. And I want to end with just two thought experiments. Um, hopefully they will somewhat demonstrate how hydrogen um, will be required in the future. Um, I wanna ask the question whether or not the LA Long Beach port can become zero emissions. 
and to um, analyze some of the aspects of making that port completely zero emissions. In other words, I want all the ships to be zero emissions. I want all the trucks and trains that are leaving to be zero emissions. Is it possible to actually make that zero emissions with batteries? Is it possible to make all of that zero emissions with hydrogen? And what I'm showing here is some analyses of ours where we are looking at the ship size. This is the um, 20 foot equivalent unit. That's just the container, a typical container from a container ship. And you can see here, these are ships that go from 1000 TEUs to 13,000 TEUs. So this is getting bigger and bigger ships. And we're looking at the percentage of original cargo space and tonnage that could possibly be um, allowed on a ship, a zero emissions ship <laughs> that used battery electric technologies, battery energy storage systems here in red, or gaseous hydrogen in green, or liquid hydrogen in blue. Okay, so what, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that the battery energy storage volume indicated by these red dots here, in the most optimistic case of this 1000 TEU ship only allows 40% of the original volume. And because batteries are very heavy, only about 8% of the original tonnage. And for all the other cases, it's worse than that. Batteries are not going to be used to make ships zero emissions. They're too heavy for that purpose. But the hydrogen cases are all shown up here in green and blue. And yes, the gaseous hydrogen case in green here um, does take up a lot of volume on the ship, but only around 20% of the original volume, leaving 80% of the ship able to, to carry what it was carrying previously. And the liquid hydrogen cases are almost all at an equivalent capacity of tons and volume of cargo that they could contain. So you see here, it is feasible to make ships zero emissions with hydrogen. Another way to think about this is to also consider, consider the distance that these ships must travel. And if it's a short distance, then battery electric kind of gets up into the range of fuel cells and hydrogen, okay, but not quite as good because again, batteries weigh more than hydrogen and fuel cells. But anytime you wanna go a long distance with those ships, for example, 17,000 nautical miles, no battery technology can make it that far, even carrying no cargo. But the hydrogen and fuel cell technology can make it. So how are we gonna make the hydrogen then if we're gonna make this LA Long Beach port zero emissions? We have to make a lot of it, um, 8.9 million tons every year. Is it possible to make that much from renewable energy? Well, we're looking at lots of options for this, but one of the options is to think about offshore wind. And the California coast is a great resource for offshore wind. Um, we could also make it from onshore wind and solar. We've looked at that too, but I'm gonna show just the one result from offshore wind at three farms here. And we know that the costs of these offshore technologies, even the floating offshore platforms are coming down dry, quite dramatically. We found that we could make all 8.89 million tons of this hydrogen with just three offshore wind farms, one in Southern California, one in central Northern California and one in the Humboldt area here. Just three large wind farms can make the entire LA Long Beach port zero emissions using the hydrogen vector, all ships, all trains, all trucks, in and out, zero emissions. The second thought experiment I want to suggest is uh, regarding data centers. We've been fortunate to work with Microsoft for many years on engendering zero emissions in their data centers. And data centers are kind of a microcosm of the 
whole energy system at large. And so I, I wanna suggest that data centers, if, if we could make data centers zero emissions and engender the reliability of power delivered to those data centers um, with zero emissions, then we uh, have a chance to actually make the whole world zero emissions. And these are some of the configurations that we've considered, uh, battery storage with wind and solar power coming in, um, excess power to gas where we have wind and solar coming in and feeding the data center, but whenever there's excess available, making hydrogen out of it, or taking all of the sun and wind power and making hydrogen out of it, and then just feeding hydrogen to the data center through fuel cells. And we've looked at various regions or various places, Wyoming, Iowa, Virginia, and Texas, they have different wind dynamics, different solar dynamics. And we're trying to figure out, hey, could we really make these data centers 100% zero emissions in a very reliable way? And I wanna suggest here some of the modeling assumptions. They included some standard single axis tracking solar, um, wind power in these two megawatt wind turbines, um, and electrolyzer and fuel cell efficiencies that are shown here, um, and battery system efficiencies that are shown here. Note that the battery does have much higher efficiency. And we also, if we have a hydrogen case, must account for the energy storage system because the energy storage system at this scale is probably gonna be liquid. And we have to account for all of the energy that it takes to bring the hydrogen to these very low pressures very low temperatures, excuse me, and account for boil off losses and the like. And if you put all of this together, oh, notice here, we have to account for self-discharge too, right? That phenomenon that I talked about earlier with regard to batteries. If we put all this together, we can optimize the system for various amounts of sun and wind power. This is showing 100% um, sun power on this end and 100% wind power on this end of the graph. And so you can see the amount of wind power in green going up and the amount of um, solar power going down over time. If we install just solar power, we need to install almost 500 megawatts of peak capacity. If we install only wind, we only need about 120 megawatts of peak capacity. That's because wind in this particular Wyoming location is available at higher capacity factor. And what you can see is that you can optimize the system for various um, uh, goals. One of the goals that you could optimize for is having mo most of the renewable power go directly to the data center. See, so we can get about 81% of the power directly from the sun and wind. If we install 50% roughly wind and 50% solar. We could also optimize for the smallest storage system size. And that's what's shown here at 15% wind and 85% solar. Only 72% then goes directly to the data center. We could also optimize for lo lowest amount of renewable energy installed, and that is for the 100% wind case. And then we can analyze all of these various options at various locations for the levelized cost of energy delivered to the data center. And that's what's shown in this graph. I'm looking, I'm showing here this table of the size of the systems that had to be installed for the hydrogen case on the left hand side here and the battery case on the right hand side here and then all of the other systems that need to be included. So for example, in the case of hydrogen, we need some place to store the hydrogen in this doer. We need a liquefier. We need operations and maintenance. We need energy for all of that liquefied hydrogen storage. Okay, so you can see we're trying to account for every single expense in the hydrogen case. And notice also that we had to install more wind and more solar in the hydrogen case than we did in the battery case. And again, this is because the batteries are more efficient. Okay. But what about the bottom line cost? The bottom line cost, primarily because massive hydrogen energy storage can be accomplished with a small fuel cell, small electrolyzer and a big tank 
we have separate power and energy scaling in the hydrogen case that we don't have in the battery case. The batteries come at a fixed amount of kilowatt hours and kilowatts, a fixed amount of power and energy. So we have to add more and more batteries to accomplish this seasonal storage that is required to make it through the year. Every, and the bottom line is this, we can deliver 100% renewable energy reliably to a data center for about $120 per megawatt hour levelized cost. The battery case is way more expensive than that because we need just too many batteries. Every single one of the cases that we have looked at so far has 100% renewable with all the storage accounted for producing a hydrogen case that's significantly cheaper. And this is also going to be the case in our economy writ large. When we need massive storage, when we need seasonal storage, it's going to be cheaper to store it as hydrogen, even though it has lower round trip efficiency. Now, I haven't been able to discuss all of the features that hydrogen might be able to help with. Um, there are at least 11 features that I think are required for a zero emissions and 100% zero um, carbon and pollutant emissions future. Um, we did uh, publish a review paper, however. Um, it's called Hydrogen is Essential for Sustainability. And you can find that in current opinion in electrochemistry. Um, I encourage you to look at that if you want to know other things about hydrogen and how it can be used. So I thank you for your attention and uh, welcome a discussion um, and hope I, hopefully I can answer some of the questions that you might have related to hydrogen and 100% renewable future. Jack, thank you so much uh, for that just amazing talk. Um, so I, I invite anybody who has a question to use the Q&A option and we'll, uh, you know, Jack can read those or I can read those and we can, we can start doing it. Um, we have a question from Barbara. Um, she has her hand up. I don't know, Barbara, if you can, I think you may have to ask your question in the, in the Q&A box. Sonia, you can let me know if that's true. I was actually trying to uh, just say this was a great talk and put my hand up. <laughs> I was trying to clap, not, not uh, ask a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Thank um, you, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah, that, that means a lot coming from you, Barbara. It really does. It Thank does. you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, we, have a t we have a question here from Adam that says, um, let us know how one can get the PowerPoint and to see this recording again. So I think if, as long as Jack is okay with it, we're going to be posting this on the Solutions That Scale site. Mm -hmm. um, along with all of our other previous talks, and the, the slides will also be available there. Um, as we're waiting for other questions, let me ask a, a question, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I know you've thought about this. Um, what would it take for UCI as a campus uh, to go 100% emissions free? Uh, what, what would that look like? Uh, thank you so much for that question. And as you know, um, UCI and all of the UC campuses have a goal of at least in tier one, tier two um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to be completely carbon neutral in just four short years. <laughs> so this is a very uh, important question for achieving that. And in every single one of our campuses, um, the first thing I suggest is we need to install a lot more solar power. Um, we have places on our campus where we need to install more solar, where we can install more solar, uh, like on top of our other parking structures. We have new parking structures going in. This is a very important thing to do, install more solar. But like every urban environment, um, there is insufficient space for us, even if we used all of Aldrich Park and all of our open land, which I don't suggest, okay? to install enough solar to meet all of our demands. Um, and when we install a lot of solar, we start to need um, storage resources on campus just so we don't export it to Southern California Edison, which they don't allow at the scale that we are. Um, so we have to install solar. Then we also should install some storage um, systems on our campus and both battery energy storage 
and hydrogen energy storage are viable options. But again, remember that I, I can't make, we can never make all of our own energy on campus using solar on campus alone. So we have to depend also on some um, external resources. And those external resources can be delivered in the form of biogas. And UCI is already planning on buying biogas and having it delivered through the natural gas system to our power plant. I suggest that's not gonna be sufficient either though, and it doesn't um, fully close our carbon balance. We need also off-campus resources of renewable power. And the university is investing in these as well. Um, Interestingly though, those also need to be complemented by a, a storage system. As a matter of fact, already the off-campus solar farms that we have committed to buying all the power from are already experiencing curtailment and negative prices because solar is being made at too high a quantity throughout the California grid. And there again is where storage is gonna be required. And I wanna suggest that again, a combination of batteries for the short duration storage and hydrogen for the long duration storage and the massive storage is gonna be required. Um, and then we can deliver to our central power plant renewable hydrogen from those facilities, okay? And renewable electricity when it's available at the time we need it. Only when you put all of that together, do we really achieve zero emissions and achieve it in a way that is replicable throughout the rest of society. Uh, we can't make it replicable throughout the rest of society if we eliminate the gas system and eliminate our power plants on campus. Doing that will only force the future generations to handle the storage problem elsewhere. Right? We got to do some of the storage, some of the generation, some of the power generation from resources that come from off campus. Hydrogen and batteries all going to be important for doing that. Thanks, so Dan. Um, <laughs> um, so Roger uh, McWilliams is asking, are there uh, uses of hydrogen as energy sources around us now in Southern California? So the biggest use of hydrogen in society today is for making ammonia and for um, petroleum refining. Um, and interestingly, we could decarbonize those quite readily if we wanted to make renewable hydrogen from sun and wind power. And, and this is a very um, important um, aspect, um, in particular, the ammonia one, right? Which we um, probably forever will be making for our food supply. Um, uh, that's a very important one for us to consider decarbonizing in this way, uh, making renewable hydrogen. Thanks. And we've got a couple questions here that talk about major obstacles, um, public policy obstacle, uh, uh, obstacles, um, international obstacles. You know, what, what, are, or what are the major things that, that you see uh, in terms of, of implementing hydrogen more in, in the energy system? Well, I suggest that some of the ideas that I presented have a number of um, technological um, uh, barriers that should be overcome through research development and demonstration. Um, they include things like whether or not hydrogen would um, be harmful to existing infrastructure in any way. Uh, we know about the phenomenon of hydrogen embrittlement of metal pipeline materials. Um, that will have to be investigated in some jurisdictions. Um, we also know about hydrogen leakage, which is different than other gases and may need to be investigated. We know about other things like end use appliances that might be able to tolerate a certain amount of hydrogen, but not pure hydrogen, okay? Um, so there's a lot of technological things over time that will require some um, investigation. Um, Fortunately, there are people all around the world that are um, doing this, including us here at UCI that are investigating some of these very uh, challenges. But as you indicated, James, there are not only technical challenges for introducing hydrogen um, at the scale I'm talking about in society. There also are policy challenges. Um, 
these are being rapidly advanced and considered throughout Europe, for example. So there are already pipeline injection standards uh, for renewable hydrogen that go up to 12% in various countries throughout Europe. We don't have that here yet, right? We cannot yet inject hydrogen into the natural gas system anywhere in the United States. Um, that's one of the reasons why, for example, when, um, uh, when I wanted to try that, I had to do it on the UCI natural gas system. <laughs> and fortunately, our facilities management team was willing to try it with us, right? So our team at APEP was able to, for the first time in the entire US, actually make renewable hydrogen and inject it into our natural gas system and partially decarbonize the power that was being generated by our power plant. So um, yeah, so the policy world has to um, advance to, to engender an initial injection of a certain amount and then a transformation over time that would allow these features, uh, you know, the, the reliability, the long duration storage, the massive storage, um, the resilience, all of these things to allow these features to be engendered in our zero emissions future. <clears throat> Thanks, Jack. Um, we, Adeli is asking about, um, you know, what about China, India, Brazil, South Africa, et cetera? Um, what, do you, what do you see about um, in, in terms of them embracing hydrogen? So I don't know too much about the South American countries that you mentioned there, but I do know uh, um, quite a bit about China. And China is making a huge investment in hydrogen and electrolyzers and fuel cells. So huge, as a matter of fact, that as a single investment, people are predicting hydrogen to be produced by Chinese resources, okay, alone, at less than a dollar a kilogram. This was an analysis by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, just the Chinese investment could make hydrogen cheap because they're investing in so much of this conversion technology. And, and I want to draw your attention to what China has done previously for sun and wind power, right? Their huge investments in those are one of the primary reasons why sun and wind power are cheap today. So the same sort of um, glide path and um, learning curve that has been already applied to sun and wind power is likely to actually happen for hydrogen, electrolysis, and fuel cells as we go forward. And China's a big player in that. The other big players from my perspective are in Europe, um, also Canada, um, Australia, um, Japan. They're all also investing. Thanks, Jack. So let me just uh, very quickly, um, Cyril's asking about, um, you know, the possibility of sharing this talk with Irvine Unified School District. Yeah. That's certainly, I think, fine. We're going to we're going to post the, the recording of this talk and the slides on the Solutions That Scale website. So if you just type Solutions That Scale uh, into Google, actually, you'll this will pop up. And, and if you just go to uh, talks, it'll it'll be there. So definitely happy to for you to share it. Um, let's see, we've got a couple uh, more talks. So Dan uh, Stokels is asking about um, uh, what about pollutants? Um, are, are there benefits for using hydrogen that, that could um, reduce things like ozone de depleting substances and, and other kinds of pollutants besides energy? Thank you so much, Dan. I'm glad you uh, highlighted that. I, highlight, I highlighted uh, criteria, criteria pollutant emissions and air quality as an important thing to also consider in addition to greenhouse gas emissions and climate. Um, and um, some of the technologies that I have included in my presentation are combustion technologies. And combustion technologies can have reduced emissions or increased emissions when they use hydrogen instead of fossil fuels. Um, so this is a, um, an active area of research here on our UCI campus. I want to suggest that our UCI combustion lab, led by Professor Vince McDonald and Scott Samuelson, um, they're doing research right now to make sure that if hydrogen does get introduced, it won't increase emissions at least, and if, if we can, to actually reduce emissions. 
um, I want to suggest that the future that I presented over time increasingly replaces in non-attainment areas, these combustion conversion resources with fuel cell conversion resources. And then we achieve in those areas, completely zero emissions. Zero when we make the hydrogen, zero as we deliver it, and zero criteria pollutant and greenhouse gas emissions when we convert it in fuel cells. So this is another important technology to advance. It's not just the hydrogen production and putting it in the pipeline and then using it in combustion, okay? Um, I do wanna say though, that in some circumstances, uh, combustion, I believe, will be used forever. <laughs> so I wanna, and I wanna highlight just two, okay? Um, we can't, I don't think that fuel cells will be used for aircraft propulsion. Aircraft propulsion requires such high power density that gas turbines are probably forever going to be used in aviation. But we can make those fuels that go into the gas turbines from renewable hydrogen and CO2 that we capture from the air. And then to make a liquid fuel that you can carry on board, this is how we make aviation zero emissions, but it still has combustion, still has some criteria pollutant emissions. So this is one example where I think we can handle a little bit of criteria pollutant emissions. And we also are getting increasingly better at reducing those from gas turbines. Again, with some research led here at UCI. Um, second application I wanna consider is um, remote power plants. And again, even in these remote locations, we wanna make sure that the emissions are as low as possible and using selective catalytic reduction and other technologies we are doing that on our campus and we're doing it even in these remote power plants. Some of those maybe we can allow to remain combustion fired and not have to replace them with fuel cells unless the fuel cells get cheaper than those. <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to highlight two instances in which we might still want to use combustion in this zero emissions future. Thanks, Jack. Um, we have, maybe we should close with this final question. Should we hope that UCI becomes a hydrogen sanctuary by demonstrating how all aspects of hydrogen production and utilization can be successfully addressed? Should we hope for that? I think we should definitely hope for that. Um, I don't know of another place um, um, in the United States there probably are several places, unfortunately, in Europe and in Japan <laughs> that have very large efforts focused upon hydrogen and all of its uh, possible contributions. We are fortunate here to have been working in this area for quite a long time. And the leadership of Scott Samuelson, Vince McDonnell, um, and others um, like me over the years has been significant. And we are especially blessed in recent years to have other and a very broad cross-section of electrochemists um, who have been here for a while. These include Reg Penner and Shane Ardo and uh, many others in your uh, school. Um, but new arrivals like Plamen Atanasov, Irina Zenyuk, and Vojislav Stamenkovich, we're starting to, I think, gather, okay, a group of faculty and expertise that is unparalleled, I think, <laughs> in the US. Compare us to Europe, I think we might still be behind a bit. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you're not the first person I've heard say that, that, that we really are uh, in the upper echelons of electrochemistry. And I, I, I definitely agree, obviously. So that's a great thing to, to end on, uh, Jack. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I'll remind everyone again, it will be up on the website soon, um, the Solutions at Scale website. So, so take a look there and feel free to share it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Bye. Bye.